Okay. Um, so in terms of the schedule, I haven't gotten a chance to change this yet, but I will. We'll finish up Chapter 9 on E1 reactions on Wednesday, and then we'll start E2 after the exam next week. So I'll adjust that um, so that today and Wednesday we'll do E1, um, the E1 reactions, because there's two different kinds. And then we'll start E2 afterwards. So I'll bring the I'll bring the Canvas reading assignments and all of that up to date um, after class, just so you know. But today was going to be E1. It still it still is going to be E1, or anything else that you have questions about. And then we will finish up anything else for E1 on uh, Wednesday. So questions about. E1, SN1. Is this a scheduled question? Is our test Monday or is it Wednesday? It's next Monday. Isn't that what it says? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I don't move exam dates, so it's that day. Topics may change, but if I move days, then all hell breaks loose. Because then people are. Yeah, they have to stay on that date. Mm -hmm. Any? So I was just curious, so like when it says like the substrate, like the reading of the reactions based on the substrate, is that the pro is it the product? I'm really confused about what the substrate is. The substrate. Uh, is this in chapter eight or nine? It's nine. It's just like the rate the first order rate of reaction is K substrate. And if it's the second order of these two is K. Oh, so so they're using I think I think they're using substrate to equal alkyl halide. Okay. So I think what when I write it, it's concentration of alkyl halide. It sh it should really be concentration of the alkyl group attached to the leaving group, because the leaving group doesn't always have to be a halogen. But I think that's what they're talking about okay. when they're talking about substrate, because nucleophile is nucleophile and. So the rearrangements, let's postpone for a moment. Maybe Wednesday, we'll do some rearrangements. Um, the alcohols for E1. So <clears throat> that let's let's do. Well, we can do an alcohol. Okay, so if I want to do an elimination reaction using an alcohol, I, I have to have the OH group leave. And there's a problem with the OH group leaving. And that is that if it leaves, it leaves as hydroxide, and hydroxide is considered a strong base. So OH itself will not leave on its own. And there is no nucleophile strong enough to come in and kick it off. So as it stands, there's nothing I can do with an alcohol in an SN or an E mechanism until I do this. Until I react it with H plus and convert the OH into a leaving group. Okay. So if I take my alcohol and my H+, plus, my oxygen is basically going to be my nucleophile, and my H+, plus is going to be my electrophile. So I'm going to protonate the oxygen. And I'm going to say over and over again for the rest of this semester and next semester, whenever you have an oxygen species and you add acid to it, the first step is always protonate the oxygen. And so that's what we're going to do. And so when we do that, what we end up forming is our oxonium ion. Now, if the oxonium ion were to leave, if I take this pair of electrons and I now give it to the oxygen, and the water was to leave, the water is going to leave as water. And that's a much weaker base 
which means that the water is going to be a better leaving group than OH minus. And so if you want to make OH minus leave, you need to turn it into a good leaving group. The way we turn it into a good leaving group is by protonating it. So now the water can leave. And so I can end up with water and my carbocation. And this reaction where I'm breaking the carbon-oxygen bond and losing the water is exactly the opposite of what we did in SN1 by taking the water and having it come in and add to the carbocation. So this is exactly the opposite step. So now I have my carbocation. And the only question now is, what do I do with my carbocation. And that's going to depend on where DH plus come from. Okay. So there's two choices here. Let's say my H plus came from HBr or HCl or HI. any of those three acids. Well, what was left over then after the H plus adds to the water? I'm going to have a halide ion. And so after the water leaves and I end up with a carbocation ion, cation and, an, and a halide ion, what's going to happen? The halide ion is a good nucleophile. And so it's going to come in and add to the carbocation so that what I'm going to end up doing is I'm going to end up doing substitution. So I would end up, if this reaction was with HBr, I would end up with 2-bromobutane. If it's HCl, it would be 2-chloro or 2-iodobutane. So it depends on the carbocation, if it reacts or not, depends on whether H+. Plus what it comes from. What is its source? So if it's HX, then I'm going to add a halogen to it. Okay. Now that is, this mechanism would be classified, and we have to broaden our terms here, and we would call this an SN1 mechanism. And we would call it SN1 because I'm going to broaden the one term to say anything that's unimolecular has to involve a carbocation intermediate. Okay. So SN1 also includes this mechanism because I'm doing substitution. I'm replacing an OH with a halogen, and I am going through a carbocation intermediate. Now, no other intermediates count for one. Oxonium doesn't count. Anything else, carbocations are the only thing that's important. So if you have a mechanism with a carbocation, it will be a one mechanism. If there's no carbocation, it's a two mechanism. Okay. So this is one reaction that can occur, SN1. Now that I don't think is a question you asked because you... I think you used the word dehydration. Yeah. So a dehydration reaction is not SN1. Okay. So let's, what else could happen? What else could happen is a dehydration reaction means that I am going to take and dehydrate this molecule, dehydrate, means lose water. So I'm going to end up with water as my product and in this in this kind of a mechanism I'm going to lose the H and the OH together to form water and the final product that I'm going to make has a double bond. So this is dehydration. And in chapter 9, they talk about both. 
They talk about both doing SN1 and substitution with alcohols. They also talk about doing dehydration with alcohols. So the dehydration reaction, we're going to lose water. So what does that mean in terms of this mechanism? What that's going to mean is that I'm going to, that the carbocat, or sorry, the H plus has to come from a different source, number one. So I'm going to use something like H2SO4 or H3PO4 as my source of H plus, sulfuric or phosphoric acid. These are both going to be sources of H plus. As sources sources of H plus, we're going to add the the H plus to the oxygen make and make the oxonium ion. Since this is a secondary carbon, I can lose the water molecule, which I didn't say earlier. If I'm going to lose water, I have to make sure that I can form a stable carbocation. And so I'm right back where I started. Now, the thing about H2SO4 and the thing about H3PO4 is this. When you take HSO4 and you deprotonate it, you get HSO4 minus, which is, well, yeah, of course you get that. But what's the structure of HSO4 minus? The structure of HSO4 minus looks like this. This is an incredibly weak base. And being a weak base also then means that this is a weak um, No, it means its conjugate acid would be strong. So weak base, strong conjugate acid, that's fine. But what is, but what is a weak base? A weak base in terms of nucleophilicity is going to be a weak nucleophile. So this is also then a very weak nucleophile. And we haven't directly said that, but it's true that if you have a strong base, strong bases are going to be really good nucleophiles. And we're going to run into trouble later because the issue is going to be if I have a strong base that can act as a base or, I have a, or it can act as a nucleophile, which one is it going to do? And we're going to be going through that question throughout the semester and the rest of the year. But this being a weak base also means it's a weak nucleophile. Why is this a weak base? Because it's very stable. Why is it very stable? Why is this HSO4 minus very stable? What is it able to form? It's able to form some resonance structures. More resonance structures you can draw, more stable the molecule. More stable the molecule, weaker the base. So why do I want a weak nucleophile as my conjugate base? Because once I protonate the water, and I ha or once I protonate the OH, make water, have the water leave, I don't want a nucleophile to attack that carbocation. And so if I don't have a, a nucleophile to attack that carbocation, what's going to happen? Now that carbocation I'm going to call my alpha carbon. It is attached to two beta carbons. What are attached to beta carbons? Beta hydrogens. Remember back a couple chapters in Top Hat, they had you doing alpha and beta. That's the foreshadowing. Right. If you're like, I don't remember that, that's why foreshadowing has mixed results. 
So that's where they first introduced the idea of alpha and beta hydrogens and alpha, alpha and beta carbons. So now what's my mechanism going to become? Now it's going to become E1. And so elimination means I form a double bond. So I just eliminated water. Now I'm going to eliminate the H+. Plus. And so in this case, I have two hydrogens, two beta hydrogens. I've got beta hydrogen 1 and beta hydrogen 2. If I lose beta hydrogen 1, what's going to happen is I'm going to break the carbon hydrogen bond. I'm going to lose that as H1 plus. So it's going to leave as an H plus, just like H plus left from alcohol or the water molecule in an SN1 reaction. It's going to leave here, except now that lone pair isn't used to, in, in oxygen, it was used to restore the second lone pair. In this case, I'm going to use it to form a double bond, which will get rid of the carbon carbocation. And so in this case, my product is going to look like that, and I'm going to have the double bond to the left beta hydrogen. So that's one possible product. The other possible product is to lose this beta hydrogen 2. So I can lose H2, the second beta hydrogen plus. I'm gonna, and that's going to form the double bond then in the middle. So I can form product A or I can form product B. And this is true for any E1 mechanism. For any E1 mechanism, whether you're le losing a water or whether you're losing a halogen, you're going to form a carbocation. That carbocation is the alpha carbon. Then you're going to form a double bond to all the different beta carbons. And then the only question is, which one is the major product? So this is a new type of reaction because I have multiple products and whenever I do a reaction that has multiple products I always ask the question what's the major product and what is the major product it is the product that is major meaning the highest percentage so usually if there's two products it'd be like 50.1 percent would make it major there are multiple multiple products more than two it's just the one that has the highest percentage so that's the major product, and there are always rules that go with determining the major product. Okay. And in this case, what's the rule? We're going to form the product that's most stable. So in this case, in an E1 reaction, you always form the most stable product. And that's the rule. But for every reaction, you need to have a rule. So that's the rule for this one. That is also called Saitsev's rule. And Saitsev, the name Saitsev is spelled multiple ways because he was Russian. It got translated to German, got translated to English. So there's various ways to spell his name. And what Saitsev did was he did these dehydration reactions. And when he did these dehydration reactions, what he always found was that he got the more substituted product is what Saitsev got. Which was pretty amazing at the time because they didn't have any spectroscopy to determine the structures. Probably didn't know carbon had four bonds, but determined that it was the more substituted double bond. Didn't know that was the more stable product. That probably took decades after the fact. 
assuming Sates, assuming Saitsev really did this, which is what I always say, but there's going to be another Russian chemist called Markovnikov, and Markovnikov didn't do any of the stuff we give him credit for. But yet we call it Markovnikov's rule, despite the fact that we really he didn't do any of that. If you look at the original paper that he had, so there's people like, well, why do we even call it that anymore? Because textbooks are hard to white out. So Saitsev found that he he got the most substituted product, which we now know is the most stable product. So my question would be, well, before I get to my question of whether it's A or B, what does that mean? What does it mean that the most substituted double bond is the most stable Y? And in your book, they probably talk about doing reactions and looking at di energy diagrams. I'm going to kind of skip through that. Um, here's what happens. A carbon-carbon double bond can only have four things attached to it. At this point, I would say, remember that? And then you would be like, I don't know if I remember that. Well, we have cis and trans, which depended on four things being attached to a double bond, two on each side. So if you have four things attached to the double bond, double bonds like to withdraw electron density. They like to get electron density. That's what makes them more stable. So what happens when I put an alkyl group on a double bond? The same thing that happened when I put an alkyl group on a carbocation. The hydrogens become slightly positive. The carbon becomes slightly negative. That, negatively, that slight negative charge means the carbon can be philanthropic and it can donate into the double bond and the double bond likes that because it makes it more stable. So the more alkyl groups you can put on the carbon, the more stable the double bond will, will be. And you can have a maximum of four things attached to the double bond. Four alkyl groups. Okay. So Saitsev didn't know that that was a source of stability. He just knew that he got the more stable, he, he just knew he got the more substituted product. Now we know that each alkyl group stabilizes the double bond. So E1 reactions always give the most stable, most substituted double bond. Everybody kind of with me? Yes, no? So then, going back to this, what would be the major product of this reaction? Would it be A, B, C? C would be that they have the same that they have the same percentage, or both, I guess both both would be the major product, or D I don't know. I believe it's the abbreviation. Okay. So which one of these is the major product, A or B? Okay, we have 30 Bs and a couple of As and a one same. So the overwhelming answer is B is the major product and B is the most stable product. Okay. So let me just go through and give you um, give you a hint in terms of if you're having a difficult time counting the number of alkyl groups that are attached. For product A, there's got to be four things attached. Anything that's not shown is a hydrogen. So if you put the, put the hydrogens on the double bond, there's three hydrogens and one alkyl group. If you, get, if you can put the hydrogens on the double bond, 
you're always going to have 4 minus the number of hydrogens equals the number of alkyl groups. So if you got three hydrogens, that means you have one alkyl group. Up here, we have a hydrogen here. We have a hydrogen there. right? And so that's two. So four minus two means we have two alkyl groups, which we have. Counting alkyl groups, we have our carbon-carbon double bond here. What do we have attached over here? One carbon. Over here we have our double bond. What do we have? Carbon and carbon. So we've got our two alkyl groups. So two alkyl groups versus one alkyl group. Two is more stable. B is the major product. And that's going to be true for any, al any E1 reaction, whether it comes from an alcohol or whether it comes from an alkyl halide. And that also is then the difference between when you react alcohols, the source of the H plus makes a huge difference. Because if it's something like HBr, you're going to get substitution. If it's something like H2SO4, you're going to get dehydration or elimination. So the source of the H plus has to be shown. Now, the other thing you'll see with this reaction is that it's H2SO4 or H3PO4. There is heat. If you ever see a delta, delta in organic means heat. That's the symbol for heat. And so that's how we typically do dehydration. E1 with no SN1. That's a long answer to your question. I feel like that might be beneficial. Like, I understand what we just did, but maybe we could do like a chart of like the overall like E1 and like what happens with each. I just feel like it's like Okay, a chart. How about we do for how about let's do this chart first? Alkyl halide, strong nucleophile, weak nucleophile. And then let's go primary, secondary, and tertiary halide. And let's predict the reactions that we would get from a strong nucleophile and a weak nucleophile. Remembering that a strong nucleophile is anything with a negative charge, a weak nucleophile is either water or alcohol. And then we'll add into this chart. Okay. So if I take a prime if I take a primary alkyl halide and I react with a nucleophile, what mechanism do I get? I'm going to get substitution, but what kind? So let's start with SN. So every one of these is going to be an SN reaction. So primaries can only undergo what kind of mechanism? SN2. And tertiaries can only undergo SN1. That leaves us with secondaries. Secondaries can do either SN1 or SN2, so which one are they going to do? Well, let me give you a little help on that. Weak nucleophiles, like water and alcohol, can only react with carbocations. They are so elect they're still electron rich, but they're not super rich. So they, can, they have to react with the most electron poor. So in, in this case, weak nucleophiles can only do SN1. So can they do SN1 with a secondary? Yes. Why? Because a secondary can form a stable carbocation. Can a weak nucleophile react with a primary, though? No, because that primary cannot form a carbocation. So you won't get a reaction if you try and take a primary halide and react it with a 
weak nucleophile. Secondaries, secondaries, if there's a strong nucleophile, it'll do SN2. So in terms of our substitution reaction, this is the chart, and I think there was a video in one of last week's canvas folders. The end, the second half of the video was, how do we determine SN1, SN2? And what I just did was like five minutes of what was probably longer than five minutes. Now, let's add to this chart. And here's what we know. We know that when you take an alkyl halide and it undergoes that first step of the mechanism, the first step of a one mechanism to form a carbocation, that this carbocation can now do two things. Get attacked by a, sub, get attacked by a nucleophile or undergo elimination. So what we're going to say is every place that there's an SN1, you also have the possibility of forming E1. So now I'm going to say SN1 and E1, SN1 and E1, SN1 and E1. So looking at this then, we're going to get those different products whenever we have a one mechanism. So we could get substitution, we could get elimination. The tricky part in this is controlling the, pro the percentage of SN1 versus E1. And so one of the things that we can do is we can force, we're going to force the reaction to be more E1 by simply using H2SO4 or H3PO4 and heat. The major product there is going to be alkene. Why? Because there's no nucleophile. And the heat also plays a role in this because the heat causes dehydration to occur. Dehydration occurs faster with heat than without heat. So if I want to force the reaction to be more SN1, what I need to do is have a nucleophile present, and I should really run the reaction with... with just a little heat, little to no heat, is going to cause the reaction to go SN1. Okay. So in terms of SN1, SN2, E1, that's kind of how they're all interrelated in that chart. Now, what you were thinking was more of a chart of, like, just an E1? Yeah, I mean, like in the video that I watched, it didn't really talk about alcohols, and we just did a whole thing on alcohols. Right, because unfortunately alcohols are in this chapter. So this morning I didn't talk about alcohols. And you're like, who cares what you did this morning? Well, I do because I've got to keep track in my mind what I did in what class. So that's the only reason why I why that's important to me. So we didn't so we didn't do out so guess what we're doing on Wednesday? We're doing alcohols. But alcohols are it's the same principle of E1 as it was with alkyl halides, which we'll do here in a minute. So it's the same it's the same principle. So when we're looking at trying to do E1, we have two choices. We can either take an alkyl halide and react it to form the double bond. Or we can take an alcohol and using H2SO4 and heat form the double bond. And because there's a couple, and there's some questions in, in the textbook in chapter 9 about doing something like 
this, which is to combine the H2SO4 with the halogen, which is what we're going to do in lab um, next week. I haven't posted the lab yet, but that's what we are going to do, is if you took a molecule like this and you said, I'm going to react this number one with H2SO4 and NABR. Now what's NABR? NABR is Na plus Br minus. What about the Na? Spectator ion that is not going to be part of the reaction, but now what happens? The alcohol reacts with H2SO4, and what does it end up doing? It, end up, it ends up protonating the OH so it can leave as water. That gives me a carbocation. Now with the Br minus present, what happens? The Br minus can come in so that now I can do SN1. So now I can do substitution. So what I'm doing is I'm introducing the idea that the alcohols are going to react like halogens, but I need the presence of the acid to make the OH group leave, whereas a halogen just will leave on its own. No, the H2SO4, the H2SO4 is the source of H+, plus, so that what we do is we protonate, and then, and then we lose the water to form the carbocation. It's at the carbocation step that the molecule, and I'm going to give the molecule personal characteristics here that it doesn't have. But at this point, the molecule with it as a carbocation decides, am I going to do SN1 or am I going to do E1? And if it's attacked by a nucleophile, not a personal characteristic, by the way. But if the nucleophile comes in and adds, it's SN1. If there's no nucleophile or if the nucleophile takes too long or the nucleophile's kind of weak, then the molecule goes... You know, I'll just lose the H plus and form the double bond. And it's helped by energy in the form of heat. So it's at this step that it decides, do you want to do SN1 or do you want to do E1? But the role of the, 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 role of the sulfuric acid is that I want to use sulfuric acid simply because there's no nucleophile associated with it. You could say in this reaction, could you do this reaction simply by doing, by adding HBr, and the answer is yes, you could. So there's a couple problems in the chapter 9 about that. So, so that's, where the alcohol, that's where the alcohol comes into play. It's just an extra step because I've got to make the OH leave. With an, with an alcohol or with a halogen? Well, I just, uh, okay, I chose. And what I chose was I chose an alcohol, and so there's my, there's my SN1 mechanism, and there's my E1 mechanism. So let's do one with a halogen. Or better yet, let's, let me ask you about the one with the halogen. So we started with the more complicated one, but that was a question that was asked. So now let's go back and do a halogen. I don't need any acid. So how about we do this? Let's say I do, let's say I'm going to say, let's take that halide and let's do an E1 mechanism on it. Because that's all I can do. Okay, so if we do that, what's our first step in the mechanism going to be? Wait, is that the one I want? Okay. 
So what's the first step? Somebody help me. Okay, okay, so let's, before we do the mechanism, let's write the final products. Because that would be the first step if I want to determine the final products. So what's the alpha carbon in this case? That's the alpha carbon. Okay, what's the beta carbon? Carbons that are attached to the alpha carbon. One, two, three beta, beta carbons. Now, if all I want to do is write the products of this reaction, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to lose a beta hydrogen. I'm going to lose the chlorine. And so maybe I should do this. There's, the, there's one beta hydrogen. Here's two beta hydrogens. Here's three beta hydrogens. If I'm just writing the product of this reaction, I'm going to break or I'm going to lose HCl. And the double bond is going to form between the alpha and the beta carbon. So let's call this beta hydrogen A. So product A then would have the double bond between the alpha carbon and beta hydrogen or beta carbon that's attached to beta hydrogen A. Let's call this beta hydrogen B. What's going to happen there? I'm going to lose HCl off of this. I'm going to lose HCl and I'm going to form the double bond to the bottom beta carbon. And then the third product, if I want to draw that, I'm going to go lose the HCl off of beta hydrogen C, which will be outside the ring. And so product C is going to have the double bond outside of the ring. And so I'm going to have those three products. So if I asked you to write the major write all the products, all the E1 products, and then tell me what the major product is, you don't need to do the mechanism. You can just simply find the alpha and the beta beta carbons, the beta hydrogens. If there's beta hydrogens, that beta carbon is going to form a double bond to the alpha carbon. So I have all three of these products. And then I would simply ask you a question. Any of those the same? Which ones? A and B are the same product. So A and B are the same product, so between A and C, let's vote. So between A and C, which one is the major product? Between A and C, which one is the major product? Because B and A are the same. I have 28 A's, 3 B's, and 3 C's. 
B is the same as A. So I have 31 A's. Although, the, how do we know A and B are the same? Because they have the same name. That's one methyl cyclohexene. Product C, we actually, I'd have to go back and look at my chart of naming because we didn't name anything like that. So that would be like a methylene cyclohexane or something like that. Okay? And why is A the major product? Because it is the most substituted. Okay. Humor me for a minute. How many alkyl groups are attached to the double bond in A? Four, three, two, or one? How many alkyl groups attached to the double bond in product A? A's 4, B3, 2, 3, 2, C, and 1, D. I've got 22 threes. And then cup some C's and D's for two and one. Okay, this double bond has a hydrogen here. How many alkyl groups are attached to it? Three. Because there's only one hydrogen. What are the carbons that are attached to this double bond? This one, this one, and this one. Over here in product C, in product C, how many carbons does it have it to attach to its double bond? Just two. One, two. Because those are hydrogens. Now, are you going to have to ha do a problem like this next week? Yes. If I give you an E1 reaction, I will ask you to write the major pro or I'll ask you to write all the products and then circle the major one. So you can do that without writing the mechanism. Am I also going to ask you to write the mechanism? Yes. So how do we write the mechanism for the reaction of a alkyl halide in an SN or sorry in an E1 mechanism? Well, what's the first step? Break the break the carbon chlorine bond. Let's put a transition state there. The transition state's going to what? Have a partial bond between the carbon and the chlorine. What kind of charges do I need? Carbon's partially positive, chlorine slightly is partially negative. Okay, and what am I forming then? I'm forming the carbocation. Look familiar? Where does it look familiar from? The problems you're going to put on the desk up there. Right? That's step one. So that now what happens? Now what happens is I need to lose that beta hydrogen 
or that beta hydrogen, which would be the same product, or that beta hydrogen. And so I'm going to get products A and C. Bless you. Okay, so that is finishing that up to form the two major products is your practice graded practice problem for Wednesday is to finish this up. So that's going to be, I'm not, you are two steps ahead of this morning's class because I didn't do this part. But then again, that's the first step in part B. So, and I, and I saw on between all of my meetings this morning and answering student questions, I did see a Piazza question that's like, I don't know how to do Part B. Can anybody help me out? That's what Piazza is there for. I don't know how helpful they found the answer, but I marked it as a good answer because it's probably exactly what I would have said in terms of the steps. Okay, so this is your practice problem for Wednesday. Um, I will be catching up on problems or questions. I will post the answer key for this later today. So if you have any questions, email me. Put them up on Piazza. So on Wednesday, what we will do is finish up E1. And any other questions that you have about SN1 or SN2, and I will adjust the website, the Canvas site accordingly.